This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome you to yet another CAP Center event. The CAP Center is committed to the importance of civic responsibility and to the belief that an informed citizenry is essential to a democracy. And tonight's speaker shares the view that in our time of political gridlock and often knee-jerk partisanship, democracy is suffering. The problem lies not with any single party. There's plenty of blame to go around. Mickey Edwards has a distinguished career as a congressman from o Oklahoma, followed by teaching at Harvard, Princeton, and North, excuse me, and George Washington Universities, and has authored several books, including The Modern Conservative Movement, Reclaiming Conservatism, and most recently, The Parties Versus the People. Currently, he is Vice President of the Aspen Institute and serves as a regular commentator on NPR's All Things Considered. He has chaired various task forces for the Constitution Project, the Brookings Institution, and the Council on Foreign Relations. This last book, the full title of which is The Parties Versus the People, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans. Well, that title suggests to you that uh, Mick is not one who shies away from a tough task. And that's what he takes up in this book. His book has been widely received from all sectors of the political process. He writes in the preface of his book, quote, my aim is to open up the process to give American voters more choice and more voice, and to eliminate the partisan forces that limit options and dilute representation. I wish to restore democracy to our democracy. He goes on to say, this is not as hard a task as it may seem. A few simple changes are all that are required. My hunch is we're going to hear about some of that tonight. By the way, this book is available for purchase and signing, courtesy of the book den, out front. Uh, after the uh, lecture and the uh, discussion. This is the second time uh, Mickey Edwards has been with us. Once before at an event across the mountain at Santa Inez. And this time it is indeed my pleasure to welcome him to a CAP Center event in Santa Barbara. Please join me in welcoming him to Santa Barbara. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for letting me come here. I mean, I especially I, I love doing stuff with the Cap Center. Although you don't need any real reason to come to Santa Barbara. I have a house in New England, so I mean, you know, coming to Santa Barbara is a really great pleasure. Uh, I am very pleased. That he, that he mentioned my book because part of it is, I, I'm going to mention a couple of times that I have a book, by the way, just uh, so you don't forget. Uh, 
one of the things, you know, the title that they talked about, and I, I, there, there's going to be a lot of admissions here. Uh, it, it's the, I wrote the, the main title of the book, which is really boring. I mean, you know, the parties versus the people. I mean, that's a big yawn. But the subtitle, now I didn't write, the, the, the book came out of an article that I had in The Atlantic a year ago, uh, and the editors of The Atlantic wrote the title. And the title was, as he says, now the subtitle of the book, How to Turn Republicans and Democrats into Americans, which I thought kind of an extreme idea. But uh, I, I said to uh, the editors, I said, you know, that seems to me to be a little bit extreme, don't you think? I mean, that they are, uh, you know, turning them into Americans. And the editor said, well, did you read what you wrote? Uh, and so... Uh, so that, that's what I want to talk about. And one of the, one of the things, uh, there, there's going to be a lot in this uh, that's going to be sort of like a confessional, because one of the things that, that I've observed is how slow and dull and dumb I am, because it took me so long, so many years to realize what I had seen and what I had been a part of and why things work the way they do. And one of the things that, that always fascinates me, because I, I live in Washington, uh, and I have people who come and I speak to various groups there, and so you've got these groups of MBAs and you have groups of scientists and all these people who come to Washington. I said, you're coming to Washington to learn how an institution is supposed to work? I mean, think, I mean you think about this politically. Has it occurred to you that every two years we go to the polls to take our country back from the people we just gave it to? I mean, there's something wrong here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little Nostradamus here and tell you a little bit about what I see wrong, and what, what, what I think has happened, uh, and uh, then we'll have some, some conversation about it. Uh, but. One of the things that uh, I observed, and here's my Nostradamus part. I, I don't know who will be the next president of the United States. I don't know who will be the next person to leave the Supreme Court. So I obviously don't know who's going to be nominated to be on the Supreme Court. What do I know? I know one thing, that if, if Barack Obama wins, and he nominates somebody to be on the Supreme Court, virtually every single Republican will be against that nominee. And virtually every Democrat, no matter what the qualifications or lack of qualifications, virtually every Democrat will be for the nominee. And if Mitt Romney wins, then all the Republicans will be for the nominee. They don't even know who it is. They're, they've already got the plans made about how they're going to, yeah, the, the Republicans already know that if Obama wins, they're going to be against whoever is nominated. And that's the system that we have. And it doesn't matter what we're talking about. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a stimulus package or a budget or a Supreme Court appointment or a nomination for a cabinet position or a sub-cabinet position what we have in Washington is two NFL teams lined up to do battle with each other instead of sitting down together and talking as Americans about how to pay our bills, what to do about providing our troops with what they need, about keeping our bridges from falling down, about all the things that we should all agree on are legitimate responsibilities of the government they were elected to participate in. Now, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is about Congress and what we've seen in the Congress. And, the, I, and keep in mind, I'm going to come back to this, I'm talking about partisanship. I'm not talking about polarization. They're two different things. There are 310 million of us in this country, and we're very diverse, 
We have different experiences, different religions, different genders, different backgrounds of all kinds. We're going to have disagreements. We're going to have differences. But at some point, we need to be able to get together and figure out how to work together, which you can do if you have sharp divisions, unless what decides your outcome is what's going to help your party win the next election. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And let me, I'm, I'm focusing a little bit on Congress. I better lay the groundwork for that. This, this will be shocking. I, are there any political scientists in the room? I mean, you know, you're going to hate this. Um, so there's a guy named Dana Milbank who writes a column for the Washington Post. And, and uh, Dana wrote a column when George W. Bush was president, and he said the president was getting ready to go overseas to, and, and for the next week or week and a half, I don't remember what it was or where he was going, but he was going to take off his role, step out of his role as head of government to function in his other role as head of state. And so I was teaching at Princeton at the time, and, I, and so I said to my students, what jumps out at you about that? The president is going to take off his head of government hat and instead, he's going to really concentrate on, on his head of state role. And I got the answers you would expect. You, the answer is like, well, he's going to be talking about basing rights or treaties, uh, you know, or flyover agreements. And that's not the answer. The answer is the president's not the head of government. This is not Peru. We don't have a head of government in the United States. We have three separate, independent, equal branches of government. But that's an exaggeration. I mean, you know, it's an exaggeration. You know, Lou's sitting out there saying that's an exaggeration. Well, look, it is. Because why is it not right? Because every single major power of the United States government is in Congress, not the White House. The power to decide whether to go to war, what to tax, how much to tax it, how long to tax it, what to spend, what to spend it on, you know, what, who should be in the cabinet, who should be on the Supreme Court, what treaties to approve. Every single major power is a congressional power. And if you have a Congress that is not focused on being the voice of the people, on coming together as the group we have elected to talk and deliberate and solve our problems, we are in deep trouble. And that's the trouble we're in. So let me give you an example of how this has happened. Uh, my, my, I'll just skip around and tell you the answer, then I'll tell you what. What were the things, is there something that the first four presidents all agreed on? Let me do let me say, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison agreed on one thing that I've been able to find. One thing. You know, they, they didn't even really like each other that much. They, they but they, they disagreed about uh, tariffs, or they disagreed about how much westward expansion and how soon, or whether they were pro-British or pro-French. What was the one thing? that all four of our first four presidents agreed on, that they talked about, they gave speeches about, they wrote about, do not create political parties. They said it over and over, do not create political parties. And what they meant was the kind of political party we have today where it's not just getting together on two or three things, but where every day on every issue, it's your team against the other team on everything. Now, how does that play out in terms of the results we see, and how do we get a Congress like the one we have, which has two teams that will not sit down together that will not talk together about the problems we need to solve. Is that an accident? Are we electing dumb people? 
No. What, what, I'll tell you something about whatever you do in business or in your personal lives or anything else. Incentives work. And we have created a political system in this country in which every single incentive is to be intransigent, to not cooperate, to not compromise, because if you are somebody seen as somebody who compromises, who talks to the enemy, you get defeated in your primary. Have you ever wondered, you know, how does somebody like Todd Aiken get to be the nominee of a major political party? There are six million people in Missouri. He got something like 200,000 votes in a primary. But that was all he needed to become the nominee. And what happened to the other, you know, five and a half, five and three-fourths millions of, of people in, in Missouri? They didn't have a say in that. So let me give you a couple of specific examples. Uh, Delaware. Uh, most of you living in California are not going to think of Delaware as a very big place. Uh, but there's a million people in Delaware. That's not chump change. There's a million people in Delaware. Joe Biden got elected to the, uh, be vice president. And so there was a vacancy for the U.S. Senate in Delaware. And they appointed a guy named Ted Kaufman, but that was a short-term thing. Then in 2010, they had to have an election about who will be the next elected U.S. Senator from Delaware. Well, everybody knew who it would be. There's no mystery. It was going to be Mike Castle. Mike Castle had been governor of the state, very popular. He had been a member of the U.S. House from Delaware, very popular. Uh, Bo Biden is Joe's son. Bo Biden is the attorney general in Delaware. Very well liked. And he didn't run because he knew he couldn't beat Mike Castle. And what happened? So Mike Castle runs, and a woman named Christine O'Donnell decides to run against him. And you know, I got to, I don't care whether you were for Christine O'Donnell or for Mike Castle or who you were for. That's not the point. So they had a primary, because that's what we do. I mean, unless you live in California. You know, we, we had a primary. And Christine O'Donnell got 30,000 votes. And she beat Mike Castle because who votes in primaries? The activists, the ideologues. So that 30,000 votes beat Mike Castle, and guess what? He was through. Why was he through? What about the general election? What general election? 46 of the 50 states, 46 of the 50 states, by collusion of the two political parties, two political power-seeking private clubs have passed what they call sore loser laws. What is a sore loser law? It says that if you sought your party's nomination in a primary or in a convention and you lost, your name is not allowed to be on the ballot. So in Delaware, of a million people, she got 30,000 votes, and that meant that the rest of the million people in Delaware couldn't choose the person they would have chosen who would be the person to make decisions about whether to go to war or what to tax or what to spend. So let, let me, oh, Delaware is kind of a weird place, right? Small. Uh, so let me jump to Utah. Utah has three million people. By the way, you'll have to do the math because I'm really terrible at quant stuff. But, um, I mean, I thought 30,000 seemed like a fairly small percentage of a, of a million, but uh, I may be wrong. Uh, in, uh, in Utah, with three million people, they had a convention. That's how the, the Republicans chose their nominee in Utah. And everybody knew who that would be. It would be Robert Bennett. Robert Bennett had been uh, in the Senate. His father had been in the Senate. Uh, and so they had a convention. 3,500 people came to the convention. 2,000 of them voted for one of the other candidates. And so Robert Bennett did not get the nomination. And so 2,000 people in Utah 
because of the sore loser laws and the way the primaries are dominated, 2,000 people kept the 3 million people in Utah from being able to have a vote on whether or not they wanted Robert Bennett to be in the United States Senate representing and speaking for them. Why do we allow that? Why do we allow these two private clubs that have no goal except power to tell us who we can choose? I mean, I, I know a few of you in the audience. I mean, you know, my niece is here. You know, so, I mean, I know, I know somebody, and I, and I know you, Martha. I, you know, I know some people. But, you know, I don't know most of you. What do I know? I know that when you buy a cell phone or a pair of shoes or a shirt, you want a choice. That's who we are. We want choices in everything we do except who decides whether our kids are going to go off and get killed in a foreign war. There we live with a system that keeps those choices from being ours. Let, let me talk about a different problem. So, so um, and by the way, some of you, because some of you I know are junkies, lose here, a junkie, you know, the question becomes obviously, well, yeah, but what about Joe Lieberman? He lost his primary and he got elected right. Why? Connecticut is one of the four states in which the parties did not get a sore loser law passed. And so after he lost, he was able then to run as an independent and be on the ballot. Uh, let me talk about redistricting. We not only allow these private clubs to control access to the ballot. Why do we do that? Why do we let private clubs control access to the ballot in a democracy where, as Thomas Paine said, the right to vote is the most fundamental right because it guarantees all the other rights? Why do we allow them to do it? Well, what about redistricting? Okay, now here's theory. Who cares about redistricting? I mean, you know, the, the, the observers, the political writers will say, well, you can tell by the redistricting kind of who's then going to have more seats in Congress. And so it has that effect. And if you really follow politics closely, you'll know that. That's really not what it's about. So let, let me, again, you know, I said I'm going to admit some things that are a little embarrassing to me. Um, I am... I'm from Oklahoma, uh, represented Oklahoma City uh, in Congress. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Oklahoma, but um, it's not like California, but every single bit of New England fits inside of Oklahoma. And it's not small. Uh, and Oklahoma City, my home, uh, is roughly the size of Boston. It's, it's not a little place. And that's, those are my people. I'm a city guy. I'm a city dude. I have never lived anywhere other than a city. I've never lived in a small city. I've never lived in a small town. You know, to me, I'll, I'll admit it, food comes from grocery stores. I, th I mean, I think I was on a farm once, but uh, I don't know. I think. So here's what happened. I was the first Republican elected in my congressional district since 1928. And my district was 74% Democrat by registration. They didn't know how I won. I don't know how I won, but I won. And it just drove the Democrats crazy. By the way, when I mentioned Democrat, all this stuff is bipartisan. The Democrats do it bad. The Republicans do it bad. Some, on some of the really bad stuff, Republicans have gotten better at doing it bad than the Democrats ever thought of. But... Uh, so it's not a partisan thing. But the, the Democrats then, the other party, controlled uh, the district by 9 to 1. I mean the legislature by 9 to 1. And they had to get rid of me. And when they couldn't, what was the other option? To find every single Republican in the state and put him in my district so that all the other districts would be safe for their party. And so they drew my district 
They changed it. It was just Oklahoma City. Now it, they drew it in a straight line from Oklahoma City all the way up to the Kansas border and then halfway over to the Arkansas border in a big upside down L. Well, I am a politician. What does that mean? It's all about me. You know, self-referential. You know, all about me. So I was teaching at, at this, I was teaching in Harvard when, when I, this came to me, and I said, I kept teaching, look what they did to me. Poor me. You know, and I had to drive all this way, and I had to learn new people. Oh, let me tell you. This is a very smart group, I know, and I'll bet if I asked you to tell me what's in the Constitution, most of you could name almost everything in the Constitution. And I'll bet there's something that most of you would forget. Maybe the single most important words in the Constitution. Every single senator and representative must be an actual inhabitant of the state from which they're elected. And there's a reason for that. And the reason was when the founders decided that we were not going to be subjects, we were going to be citizens. You know, governments tell subjects what to do, but citizens tell the government what to do. And the way we were going to make that work was that if you were the community and I was the candidate, I would know you. I would live there. I would know what your economic interests are. I would know what your political preferences were. I would know the kinds of things that affected your livelihood, and you would know me. You would know my reputation because I lived there. What happened when they redrew it into an upside-down L? I was now representing wheat farmers and cattle ranchers and small town merchants, and I didn't know their issues. I, did, I couldn't articulate their issues. And they who were entitled under the Constitution to a representative who knew them were now represented by some big city guy who did not know how to effectively articulate what their concerns were in legislation. Who got screwed? It wasn't me. It was them. It was tens of thousands of Oklahomans who did not any longer have the right to be represented by somebody who knew them and knew their concerns. Why? Because it suited the interests of the political parties to redraw the district to increase their advantages in the election. So, I mean, there, there's so many of these things. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I can come back to, to some of this, but uh, I'm going to skip over a couple of things. Uh, I'll say one thing. Uh, I'm going to say something about money. I don't usually talk much about the money part because I usually get a lot of questions about the money part, and so we can get to that. Um, what will I say about the money? Corporations are people. I mean, give me a break. Um, but, I, you know... Um, how many, I, I'm willing to concede, I'm willing to concede that there is a possibility, maybe even a likelihood, that the members of the Supreme Court understand the Constitution. I'll tell you what they don't know. Are there any lawyers in here? They don't know corporate law. The very act of incorporation distinguishes between persons and corporations. Because when you incorporate, you have immunities and protections that are not available to individual people. So, uh, well, I can get later into it. I have, I have a plan. My mind's fairly radical. I don't think any, there should be any contributions from any source except actual living human beings. No corporations, no political action committees, no labor unions, no parties, just people. So, and, and I've, I've got some things to talk about lowering the cost of campaigning and all that. I want to skip over that. I, let, let me get to what happens inside Congress. So, we talk a little about the election system, and we can get more into that if you want, or the money, but talk about what happens inside Congress. So, one day, I'm a Republican candidate 
running on the Republican ticket, and I get elected. And I step across, I thought, a magic line. And now I'm not a Republican candidate, I'm a member of Congress. With all the obligations that entails, I took an oath of office, you know, to sw I swore to uphold and defend the Constitution, which, by the way, is the only pledge anybody should ever take to uphold and defend the Constitution. Grover Norquist doesn't like that part of my speech. Um, and I, we were there together. I mean, it, Republican and Democrat standing side by side, the people who were in that freshman class with me and, and became my friends. So, you know, Al Gore and Dan Quayle and Dick Gephardt, we're all there together. And that was kumbaya, and that lasted 30 seconds. Because immediately after that, we voted on who would be speaker, and all the Democrats voted one way, and all the Republicans voted the other way. And then we decided how many people would be on each committee, you know, how many Republicans, how many Democrats. The Democrats voted one way, the Republicans the next way. It was that way every single day of the 16 years I served in Congress. Every day, it is like you're, you're permanently divided into two camps, not Americans but Republicans and Democrats. So let, let me give you an I have a chapter called um, uh, Rearranging the Furniture. Um, th there's something about this room, right? Even though I can't, I don't do this, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to stand at a lectern. But, you know, there, here you are, and there's a lectern. And if you have a speaker here, they stand at the, except for me, they stand at the lectern. And wherever you are, whatever meeting you go to, your civic club or any other club you go to, there's a place for the speaker. There's a lectern, not in the U.S. House of Representatives. There are two lecterns. There's a Republican lectern and a Democrat lectern. And there's a lecture. Uh, if, you're, if you're a Republican, well, now I'm a Democrat because of the side I've moved over. So if you're a Democrat, you stand at the lectern facing the Democrats. And if you're a Republican, you face over here at a lectern facing the Republicans. And I am so full of myself. And I am so just, oh, God, I know I can just persuade anybody of anything. And so I, my very first speech on the House floor, I said, I think most of the Republicans are going to agree with me. I'm going to get the Democrats. And I stood at the Democrat lectern and I talked to the Democrats and there was this gasp. And people, both Republicans and Democrats came up, no, no, you can't do that. You have to stand over here. Like, I'm going to get cooties if I touch the wrong lectern. Um, you cannot, you can't have... Uh, coffee or eat a sandwich on the House floor. You can't talk loudly about football on the House floor. You, you, um, you can't make phone calls on the House floor. It's unseemly. So what do you do? You go to the cloakroom. But there's not a cloakroom. There's a Republican cloakroom way over here, and there's a Democrat cloakroom way over here, and, we're, and the people who are our members of Congress don't even have soup together. And because they're in Washington working three days a week, they don't even know each other. So, sir, if you were a Democrat in, in Congress and I was there as a Republican, I would know nothing about you. Nothing. Except what party you were in, and it was the wrong party, and you were the enemy. And that's the way it is today uh, in, in our Congress. So, um, well, I, you know, I can get into other stuff, and I will. Among my proposals, uh, when you are a Republican on a committee, you have a Republican staff member. If you're a Democrat, you have a Democrat staff member. I didn't know there were Republican facts and Democrat facts, you know, but... You know, you got to have a staff member who's going to feed you what's our talking point, what's our party line. How do you get on a committee? Congressional committees are the legislative choke points. That's where everything starts. Whether a bill can move forward and be considered, how do you get on a committee? Here's the way that happens. So, Jim, let, let's assume that you are uh, a real whiz in finance, okay? You really know, you know, you know 
taxes, you know, all the financial stuff. Uh, and here's what I would say to you. I would say, you'd be really good on, on ways and means. And we'll put you on ways and means because you'd be really good at it. If you promise in advance, before you've heard a witness or read a bill, that you're going to be with the party on these three or four major issues. Take your brain out of your skull and hand it to the party leaders because we don't want you using your mind. We don't want you using your education. We don't want you listening to your constituents. We want you to toe the party line or you don't get a committee assignment and that's how it's done. And that's how, when I testified before, this was back when we had a president, you remember not long ago, uh, who would issue signing statements, just basically saying, I'll decide for myself whether I have to obey the law. Well, I thought that was a little strange. And so I was on the American Bar Association task force <coughs> that looked into these signing statements. And we all, of course, found it unconstitutional. Uh, and, and so we testified, the president of the ABA and myself testified before both the House and Senate committees. And guess what? The President of the United States saying, I'll decide if I have to obey the law. There were, believe it or not, a number of fairly smart lawyers who would argue that they had the right to do that. And still, not one Democrat thought there was any merit to it at all. On the other side, <coughs> you have my party, which is always talking about how much it believes in the Constitution, you know being told the president said, I don't have to obey the law, and they all saw nothing wrong with him doing that. Why? Republicans thought it was fine because he's a Republican president. Democrats thought it was bad because he's a Republican president because what's one of the keys in our Constitution? Separation of powers. The job of the legislative branch is to keep a check on the executive branch, but when you have uh, Congress that all it thinks about is political advantage, the, the president is not the head of a different branch of government. He's your quarterback, and your job is to keep him from getting sacked. So, you know, uh, I, I've got all kinds of other things about, uh, I, I think that uh, we should have nonpartisan speakers. We should, we should not let, uh, you know, you, did you know you don't even have to be a member of Congress to be the speaker? That shocks a lot of people. Uh, the, you, uh, I would take away the power of the party leaders to decide who's on what committee, all that stuff. Let me, let me just close with this. I'm an optimist. It doesn't sound like it, does it? <coughs> I'm an optimist. Why am I an optimist? It's not polarization, it's partisanship. And the American people have had it, have had it with partisanship. 40%, 40% of American voters today are registered as independents. Independent or unenroll, unenrolled. USA Today wrote a story that said the American people are fleeing from political parties. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples that you in California are familiar with. I don't know how any of you voted on this stuff. In 2006, the people in Washington state said, we are not going to allow these political clubs to tell us who can be on the ballot when we choose, you know, who, who should be our rep We want choice. We want everybody there and everybody be able to vote on them. And they took away from the parties the ability to control access to the ballot. They took away from the parties the ability to control district lines. You guys did it last time. Arizona is getting ready to vote on it. Louisiana already has it. The people are beginning to say, it's our country. We want choice. We didn't tell you private clubs that you could tell us that we can only choose between A and B. The revolution is beginning. The people, I don't know whether it'll all play out this way. I don't know whether other states will do it just as California did or not. 
I don't know whether there's now 13 states that have nonpartisan independent redistricting commissions. Some are better than others. But all through the country, there is coming up this, this demand that we stop this partisan name-calling that we... So I'll just give this one final example and I'll shut up. In, let's, let's assume that because of what it does, the CAP Center, that, that, that you, you, you really love what it does, and you wanted to do something in return. And you decided we're going to create a new facility. They have their own auditorium and they do all that. You know, we do all that. And you would say, we have to figure out how to do this. And so you'd all get together in a big room and you would choose somebody to be your chairman of the effort. And you'd, somebody else would agree to head up raising money. And you would all sit together and you'd figure out where should it be, what equipment do we need, what purpose should it serve. You do that all the time now, right, in whatever activities you're in. Not one of you, there's not one person in this room who would say, okay, let's all the Republicans sit over there and all the Democrats sit over there and come up with separate plans. We don't do that in anything we do except how we run our government. And so my argument is that we need to take away the power and say to members of Congress, don't be Republicans, don't be Democrats. A member of, I've, in, in the, um, I, I'll say this in the acknowledgments because nobody reads acknowledgments. I acknowledge a person whose name I don't know who stood up in a meeting when I had given the usual political answer why I hadn't done something. Republicans, you know, I'm a Republican, Democrats wouldn't let me do it. And he pointed his finger at me and said, I am so damn sick and tired of hearing Republican this, Democrat that, and I want to tell you, I'm sick and tired of it too. I want to return to the system the founders believed that they had created that empowered us not these private clubs. And so that's the, the movement that I am trying to create, and I would welcome any help. Thank you. So, uh, there you are. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, well, I think we all agree this is not the same old stuff. Uh, so there's something new here being proposed, uh, and based upon your applause, it seems to be something that uh, aroused some interest on your part. So thank you for provoking us. We are ready for any questions you might have. If you do have a question, come to one side or the other over here to the microphone so that uh, we can pick up your question. So anybody? Anybody want to bite here? What's, uh, what's being code, proposed? Yeah. I see this gentleman, and then I see this gentleman. Yes. Uh, I, I think what you're suggesting is rather fascinating uh, as a poli-sci person, which I didn't want to admit because <laughs> obviously that might put me in the wrong place. Sorry. Uh, but, but my question is, if we were to go down that road, I'm still not can't figure out how we get rid of the, the power that the lobbyists, the inequality in our country and the power that the lobbyists who are all operating out of the elite world, they seem to really be the guys who tell the Congress, Republican or Democrat, what to do. And I realize that's a, not the topic you're discussing, but I just, how, how do we come at all that money and all that power? I mean, I, I can yeah. think of a couple, three things. You can do what Stockman recommended. Let's change the Constitution and get rid of the anybody in the money issue, and that's not the speech issue, and we can do other kinds of things that, the transparency, I don't even know where the transparency went. Obviously, I was asleep when that happened. Uh, so we got the transparency right. and we got the money issue. Uh, so how do we come at that part of this problem? Well, I think there are a couple of ways. I think that's really a good, really very good question. Uh, one way is it's the, connection between lobbying, which is a constitutionally protected uh, activity, and I'm all in favor of it because you know, you're, we're, we're trying to protect 
the people from the government, and we're not trying to protect the government from the people, so you ought to have a chance to make your case. So it's the, the, the nexus between the, the lobbying for a cause and the money. That, that causes the problems. So one of the things I propose in one of those chapters is that, that we, we greatly reduce the need for the money by using free TV and radio time, by allowing candidates for Congress to do free mailings, uh, by, you know, there's a lot of different ways, you know, here in California, the way you all, uh, when there's a referendum issue, you send out information to all the voters. You know, other states could do that and do it with all the candidates. Uh huh. Well, I mean, as much information as you can give, but that, that's only part of it. The other thing is, and one reason that I support open primaries, which, by the way, is a misnomer. They're really two-tier general elections, you know, uh, is that ultimately, in order to get elected, you cannot be captive to one narrow interest. You know, because the guy who's going to win is the one who can uh, appeal knowing everybody at the polls is going to be there. You've got to appeal to conservatives and liberals, moderates, and uh, you've got to appeal to Republicans, Democrats, and Greens, and Libertarians, and all that. So you, you would reduce the ability of these small guys with the, with the checks, you know, so you reduce the cost of campaigning. That's one thing. And you increase the number of people that you have to be answerable to. I mean, it's one way. I mean, uh, there's no perfect answer, right. I don't think. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I have to say this is the most uh, creative uh, uh, talk that I've heard on this subject in, in, in my lifetime. Uh, I think what needs to be done, though, is to scale up this debate. We need to enlist, enroll the whole country, and for at least 20 years I've had the belief that we need a constitutional convention under the original, the alternative uh, approach to amending the Constitution, that is, start from scratch. We're in the 21st century, we're in the information age, we're in the post-industrial age, and many of the original concepts, uh, are, are the whole concept of uh, balance of power and checks and balances don't work anymore. And so we need to go back and start with a clean slate. And I have no fear that this would lead to anything bad, because the, the standard argument is, well, we couldn't come up with something as good as what we have right now. Well, if you look at the bar of ratification, it's so high, I have no worry about that. But wouldn't it be possible to create a framework for a public debate that's more constructive, more creative, if we brought people into uh, and had the media cover a constitutional convention uh, in the format of the original one? Well, I, I, the, the initial problem always in a constitutional convention is whether or not uh, you can limit the topics. Uh, you know, the last time we had a constitutional convention that was very limited in scope, the people who attended just changed the whole system. You know, and I don't know whether that can be limited or not, but I hope you'll forgive me, but, that, but that's a very good question, and it leads me to making, because your bigger question here is how do you make fundamental change and how do you... Uh, Boy, I hate giving this answer. I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound like Jimmy Carter, you know, like it's all your fault. Um, but it's all your fault. I mean, uh, we, we have created the system, uh, and it's not just, so I, I'm going to leap into a bigger sphere that's not part of my book. Uh, we, we have some um, fundamental problems in society that allow these kinds of bad things to happen. It's not just the electoral and, and governing systems. Um, with the exception of the people in this room, um, <laughs> uh, a good friend, you know, I was told once that if you write a book and you're trying to get people to buy your book, you shouldn't be busy promoting another book. But um, a friend of mine wrote a book a few years ago called The Big Sort. His name is Bill Bishop. And uh, I know Clinton talks a lot about it. I talk a lot. It's a great book. And here's what he found. We as a people, I mean, a lot of these problems that you talk about could be solved if we talk to each other. But most of us, except for, for you guys, most of us talk only to people we agree with. We talk to people who already share our opinions. We read George Will or Paul Krugman, but we don't read both. We watch Rush Limbaugh or uh, Keith Olbermann, but we don't watch both. You know, I, I, by the way, I'm very anti-violent. The only violence I've ever advocated in my whole life is that you take Limbaugh and Oberman and put them in a paper bag and drop them off a bridge together. But, um, <laughs> but, 
But we have this problem that, that we as a people have really, I, I would love it if you could have a meeting, convention, or whatever, where people could sit down open-minded, deliberating, talking, listening to each other, and listening without formulating rebuttals in their head as the other person's talking. You know, uh, I don't know. We, we as a society have gotten to where we cannot stand, we cannot tolerate somebody having a different opinion than our own. So we've got to deal with that. We've got to talk to people who don't share our views and listen and try to figure out where they're coming from. Another friend of mine, John Haidt, wrote a great book called The Righteous Mind mm. that also uh, deals with that. It's, it's, it's a good book. So uh, there's another thing we don't do, if I can just add one more thing. Um, you, you all know this program, This I Believe. You know, they used to be on television. Now NPR has, has resurrected it. Uh, where you figure out in three-minute segments, <coughs> what is your core belief? What do you really at, at its root believe? And that's hard. I tried it, <coughs> and I wrote kind of a little thing about this I believe at, at, at heart. Uh, and I thought about it. I said, yeah, I mean, do I really believe that? I mean, always, you know, no. so I threw it away. And, and I thought, well, this I believe. This is my root belief. Yeah, well, I don't know. So I threw that away. And you know what I finally decided on? I believe in doubt. I believe in not being so damn sure I'm right about everything. And that, you know, um, so if, if, you know, we could solve a lot of the problems with or without a constitutional convention if we could again be a deliberative people. That, that would help a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think I agreed with um, every, every comment you made tonight, or every point you made. I was wondering if you could um, speak on the, the recent election in France, because I noticed that they had, um, I think they must have at least eight or nine candidates, and wondering what you thought about that model or that um, political. Um, I, I, well, I th it depends. There are a lot of places that have a lot of different candidates on the ballot, yeah. but they don't have runoffs. You know, uh, now if you have a lot of candidates and somebody gets over 50 percent and so is the clear choice of the voters, that's great. Without the runoff, you can have <clears throat> a lot of states do this. Massachusetts does it. You know, you, if you have a lot of people on the ballot, you get 20 percent of the vote, you win, even though 80 percent of the people were against you. You know, so <clears throat> if you have a multi multiple candidate ballot, but you have to have a runoff if nobody gets over 50%. Look here, you know, just next to you, where, where Brad Sherman and Howard Berman are running against each other. It's a liberal Democrat district. No, nobody who's not a liberal Democrat could possibly win there uh, and wasn't going to win there. So they ended up at the top two. But what happens when they have the runoff? Now, who's going to win? It would have been in your old system. Whichever one could most appeal to the hard left and turn them out, and I am going to be your champion, would be the one who won. Now, the, in order to win, one of them has to be able to get Republican voters, Libertarian voters, you know, um, Greens, everybody, and, and that's, that's the only way they can win. So I am only in favor of these multi-party, if it's like this, where, where you have a top two runoff. Uh, otherwise, otherwise it wouldn't work. You just end up with people with tiny slivers of the vote, you know, having undue power. Right. That that answer it okay? Very long to run either, which is what I like. Yeah. They only had, I think, a few months. I I have mixed feelings about short campaigns. Uh, I get so tired of the commercials and all that stuff. But but you have to say that one of the things that is one of the advantages to the long campaigns. Well, it's two. One, they spend so much money, it really helps the economy. That's great. Uh, but the other is, we learn more as time goes on. Let's say, um, it, it, let, let's say that you uh, are an Obama supporter. You would have heard, well, whatever you thought of it, you would have heard the comment about the 47% after the election was already over. You know, you would have never heard it. When, when George W. ran uh, the first time, people found out about his drunk driving arrest after the election. You know, it was too late. It was, you know, a lot of people had already voted. So there, there are real good arguments in favor of shorter campaigns, and there are some good arguments for having campaigns long enough 
especially because since these offices are important, you know, that, that we learn what we need to learn because as time goes on, we find out more about the people. So, I, you know, either way. Yes. Yes. Should our votes be counted on privately owned computers that are hackable? You can hack into them by like companies like Sequoia and Debo that are owned by Republican companies. Well, you know, I think. Uh, Could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question. question the, the question is: Should votes be counted on machines that are uh, that are owned by, as you put it, Republican companies? Uh, well, I mean, they're going to be, you know the manufacturers of any machines belong to parties. I, I think the key should be uh, that there has to be transparency. You need to be able to have a system where you can check on the accuracy of the count. And, and that they're hackable. They've, they've been proven that the, you'd be hacked. those computers can be hacked into. Yeah, we had the early. same thing with paper ballots, too. I mean, what, what you have to do is be able to find out. I don't care whether it's what company, I don't care what, as long as you can make sure that the count is accurate, that, that it hasn't been tampered with. If you have, tra you have an ability to check the accuracy of, of the count, I'm fine with it no matter who, who manufactures it. The only way to do that is with paper, paper ballots. Well, why, okay, like this now I'm going to really, why, I'm sorry, you know, Lou, I'm sorry. Uh, why, why, do we ha why do we not have paper ballots? So they can steal elections. No. We have paper ballots because the news media wanted answers in a hurry and they didn't want to wait. You know, uh, that, that's why. So, you know, God, we can't wait 30 hours to find out who won. You know, we got to have it now because, you know, we got a paper to have in the morning or we got to have a, you know, we're, we, we got a 10 o'clock newscast. So, anyway, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying we ought to have paper ballots. I'm saying whatever kind of system. You know, this is the tech capital of the world here. You, you guys can come up with systems that are quick and, and, and quickly tabulated, but that you can check and make sure they're accurate. You can do that. That's not a problem. Yeah. Hi. When you talked about a small percentage of voters determining elections, it brought me to mind my feeling this year is that Ohio and maybe Virginia are going to decide the presidential election. Do you share my concerns? Well, North Carolina and Nevada, but a few. I mean, and, but the reason is that you have so many states that are not really in play because they're, they're just overwhelmingly, I mean, my home state of Republic, uh, you know, of Oklahoma, Obama's not going to win Oklahoma. There's no way. Oklahoma is now, when, when I was running, it was a heavily Democratic state. It's now a heavily Republican state. You know, uh, California is not really in play. In Massachusetts, there's no way that Romney has a chance to win. So, I mean, it's just that, that you know, when we have created the, these states that are just all locked into one camp or another, it makes no sense to waste your money campaigning there because maybe you'll, you'll get 25% instead of 24%, you know, and it's just not worth the effort. So, I don't, I mean... Again, that's us. You know, that's, we have decided that we are in one camp or another. Thank yeah. you so much, Mickey Evers. Thank you.